Now let's take a closer look at the myofilaments, which are the contractible proteins we find inside of the muscle fiber. So don't forget, inside of the muscle fiber, we have bundles of myofilaments that are called myofibrils. But when it comes to the myofilaments, there are two types, thick filaments and thin filaments. The thick filaments are thicker than the thin filaments, hence the name. And the thick and thin filaments are organized into a certain part, very, very, very particular pattern inside the myofibrils. And we call a basic unit of thin and thick filaments inside of the myofibril, we call this a sarcomere. So in the picture here up top, we can see a sarcomere and the green is depicting mostly the thin filament and the purple is depicting mostly the thick filament. And you can see there's a very particular organizational pattern to these thick and thin filaments. So let's take a closer look at each of these individual components, these thick and thin filaments. So first, let's start with the thin filament. In terms of its structure, the thin filament is actually made of three different types of protein. Most of the thin filament is made of these bead-like proteins called actin. So in the picture here, the light green oval, or excuse me, the light green circles are representing the uh, actin proteins. And actin kind of looks like two strings of pearls twisted together. Okay, so the little pearl-like structures are the actin proteins. Now you can see that there is an orange rope-like protein that's following along on the actin. And that orange rope-like protein is called tropomyosin. And then the third protein is called troponin. In the picture here, the troponin is shown as sort of like a, a beige kind of circle. And the troponin is sitting on top of the tropomyosin. Now let's look at the function of these thin filaments. Right? So the actin on the thin filament has a very important job. You might have noticed that in the pictures here, the actin had a dark green spot, right? And the dark green spot is significant. The dark green spot on the actin is the spot on the actin that is capable of binding to yet another protein called myosin, which is the protein of the thick filament. So these spots on the actin are called active sites or binding sites. This is where the myosin will bind to. During contraction, the myosin will grab onto the actin at the binding site and then pull on the actin. Okay? And that's what will cause the whole entire muscle fiber and then the muscle to contract. Another protein of the thin filament is tropomyosin. And the job of tropomyosin is to cover up the binding sites on actin when the muscle is at rest. So you can see on the picture here at the bottom, this orange rope-like protein is sitting right on top of those dark green spots. So that's our tropomyosin that's sitting on top of the binding sites covering them up. So at this point, myosin would not be able to bind to actin because it can't see those binding sites. The job of troponin, the third protein, is to hold the tropomyosin on the binding sites. So troponin just makes sure that the tropomyosin is doing its job covering up the binding sites on actin. Okay. So this is what, in the picture down here, this is what a thin filament looks like when it's at rest. Right? Um, when there's no calcium present, the thin filament is at rest. So in this picture here, we can see what the thin filament looks like when it's active. So in the presence of calcium, the thin filament will be activated. So calcium is shown as a little gray circles with the black outline. And you notice the calcium binds troponin. When calcium binds troponin, it causes the troponin to shift a little bit. And if the troponin moves a little bit, so will the tropomyosin because troponin is attached to tropomyosin. So the troponin moves, causing the tropomyosin to move, and the tropomyosin moves off of the binding sites on actin. And so now the binding sites are revealed, and now myosin, the thick filament protein, will be able to grab onto actin and pull. Before we leave the thin filaments, I want to talk about one more associated concept, which is costamers. So costamers are multi-protein complexes that connect the thin filament with the sarcolemma and the endomysium. Okay. And these are actually really, really important because this is what makes the connection between moving the thin filament and moving the entire muscle, right? If you look in the picture here, 
Down towards the bottom, we can see something in purple, which we haven't talked about yet, but that's the thick filament. And then in green and orange, we can see our thin filament that we've been talking about, the actin, the tropomyosin, and troponin. And if you notice, that thin filament is connected to that blue blob, and the blue blob is connected to the orange blob, and the orange blob is connected to the green blob, and the green blob is connected to the purple tea looking like thing, right? Well, the blue blob, the orange, the green, and the purple thing, that's all part of the costamere. And the costamere, like I said, is this multi-protein complex that connects the thin filament to the sarcolemma. So the sarcolemma, don't forget, that is just the cell membrane. So that's the phospholipid bilayer, which we can see in the picture here, how the costamere is embedded in the sarcolemma. So if the thin filament moves, the costamere will move, and that means the sarcolemma will move. Now additionally, in yellow, that long yellow rectangle, that's representing the endomygium, which is one of the connective tissue membranes of the muscle. Don't forget that the endomygium fuses to become part of the tendon. So, since the costamere is attached also to the endomygium, that means when our thin filament moves, the costamere will move, and the endomygium will move. And if the endomygium moves, so will the tendon, and so will the bone. So this is kind of kind of drawing us back into the big picture here, because don't forget the whole point of moving these proteins inside the muscle cells is to move bones. And so this shows us exactly how by moving the thin filament, we can move a bone. Next up is the thick filament. So the thick filament is really just made of one protein type called myosin. But each thick filament is composed of thousands of myosin proteins kind of mooshed together. Right? A myosin protein sort of has a, an odd shape. It looks like two golf clubs with the shafts twisted together, right? and it still has the two heads on it sticking out. To form a thick filament, what we do is we take a whole bunch of myosin proteins, and then we take their tails, which is the shaft, and put that in the center, and then let the heads stick out on the outside. The function of the thick filament is to pull on the thin filament during contraction. So during contraction, the myosins on the thick filament will grab onto actin and pull, causing the thin filament to slide past the thick filament. This process requires ATP, right? So that's one of the things that we need for muscle contraction to occur properly is ATP. Muscle contraction requires ATP. So let's take a closer look at ATP. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. ATP is technically classified as a nucleic acid, so that means that structurally it's related to DNA. Its function is quite different though. Um, ATP supplies energy for cells to do work. ATP has three phosphate groups, hence the triphosphate. And in order for ATP to supply energy, one of the things that happens is one of the phosphate groups is taken off of the ATP. We call this ATP hydrolysis. Lysis means to break and hydro means with water. So during ATP hydrolysis, we break off one of the phosphate groups by adding on water. When this occurs, we end up with ADP and just a phosphate. So ADP is adenosine diphosphate, so only two phosphates. And then we have a free phosphate group that we call PI or inorganic phosphate. It's called inorganic phosphate because it doesn't have carbon and oxygen attached to it. It's just phosphate and oxygen. The binding and release of ATP and the binding and release of ADB and phosphate and the hydrolysis of ATP, all of that is going to help to provide the energy to do work during muscle contraction. Once we use up ATP, and it's broken down into ADP and phosphate, we need to build it back up again. We need to reattach the phosphate onto AT, or excuse me, onto ADP to reform the ATP. This process is a little complicated, right? It's not just really easy just to slap the phosphate group onto ADP, right? Um, and it's going to require a lot of uh, fancy enzymes and a lot of different processes to occur. And primarily, this process of adding the phosphate onto ADP occurs in the mitochondria, and we call this process cellular respiration. Okay? So this is the main way that we make ATP is through cellular respiration. 
So muscle fibers need lots of ATP, so they have lots of mitochondria to do lots of cellular respiration to make all of that ATP. So now let's take a closer look at the interaction between the thin filament and the thick filament, what exactly is going on there, right? So we know that the thin filament is made of actin, tropomyosin, and troponin, and we know that in the presence of calcium, the calcium will bind to troponin, moving the troponin, which moves the tropomyosin, which reveals the binding sites on actin. Now, it's possible for the myosin heads to grab on to actin at those binding sites and pull. So in the presence of calcium, myosin heads can bind to actin, forming something called a cross bridge. So the connection between the myosin and the actin is called the cross bridge. At this point, there will be the release of ADP and phosphate from the myosin head, and that's going to provide the energy necessary for the myosin head to pivot. Now the myosin head, don't forget, is attached to actin. So when the myosin head pivots, it's going to pull on the actin. And when it pulls on the actin, this is going to be the movement that's produced during contraction. The thick and thin filaments are highly organized within a muscle fiber, so I want to take a closer look at that. So thick and thin filaments are organized into little segments called sarcomeres. So we can say that a sarcomere is the smallest like functional unit within a, a muscle fiber. Um, sarcomeres are made of thin and thick filaments, of actin and myosin. So in the picture here, right, if we wanted to look at like the deltoid muscle in this young man, right? We have a, a bone with a tendon with a skeletal muscle attached, right? Don't forget skeletal muscles are composed of bundles called fascicles, and the fascicles contain inside of them muscle fibers, right? So that's an individual muscle cell. And inside of a muscle fiber, we will find myofibrils, which are composed of myofilaments. Now, a myofibril is made of several sarcomeres connected end on end, right? So here we can see an individual sarcomere within this myofibril. And this is just a highly organized bunch of actin and myosin. The organization of the actin and myosin is so regular within a sarcomere that this creates a very distinct banded appearance in both cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle tissue. These bands that we can see with the microscope were called striations. So we can see like a striped appearance on both cardiac and skeletal muscle tissue because they both contain sarcomeres that are highly organized. Myosin in the sarcomere will pull on the actin in the sarcomere. And as this occurs, the thin filament will slide over the thick filament. And this is called the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. Don't forget, in science, a theory is something of which we are most sure. It's something that has lots and lots of evidence, right? So this is how we know muscle contraction to occur. All the evidence points in this direction. It's very different than how we use theory in everyday language, right? So this is the actual contraction event that we're talking about here. So in the picture, we're looking at a close-up of six sarcomeres within a skeletal muscle fiber. And you can see how the skeletal muscle sarcomeres will get smaller and bigger, and that's going to lead to contraction and relaxation of the muscle fiber, which could lead to the contraction and relaxation of the entire skeletal muscle. Up top, we see a relaxed sarcomere. So this is what it would look like when the muscle is not contracting. Okay? Um, the blue is our thin filament, and the pink that's shown towards the middle is the thick filament. You notice in the relaxed state, there is an area in the center of the sarcomere where there is no overlap between thick and thin filaments. That's the H zone, okay? And then as we go to the right or the left of the H zone, we have areas where the thick and thin filament overlap. Those will appear as the dark striations when we look at this tissue with a microscope, okay? And then as we get towards the ends of the sarcomere, right, we have another area with no overlap. There's only the thin filament there. And then you can see the thin filaments are harnessed um, on a structure. This is called the Z-disc. 
So what happens during muscle contraction is the thick filament is going to pull the thin filaments towards the center of the sarcomere, and those Z discs will move towards the center of the sarcomere. So if you look down below at the lower picture, we can see what a sarcomere looks like when it's contracted. Notice that the thick filament doesn't look any different. The thick filament doesn't really change its position within the sarcomere. The heads on the myosin of the thick filament are pulling on the thin filament, but overall the thick filament doesn't change position within the sarcomere. What has changed position is the thin filament. Those Z discs have moved closer to one another, closer to the center of the sarcomere, because the thin filaments have sl slid closer to the center of the sarcomere. Notice that the H zone, the area of no overlap at the center of the sarcomere, is very small in the contracted sarcomere. Now remember, the contraction process cannot happen without ATP and without calcium.